my name is Peter McCulley, and uh, I'm a longtime volunteer with the Goldstream Salmon Enhancement Association. I'm also a technical advisor to a number of community groups in the south end of the island, and I provide advice and, and technical uh, information for groups that are involved in salmon enhancement and habitat restoration, uh, stock assessment, and generally provide some guidance for volunteers who want to get involved in this, this sort of thing. We, we've got a really interesting uh, research program going on here and, and it's one of those things where we think about hatcheries as being uh, just about producing fish and just about taking eggs, but that's not uh, the case. Certainly we're concerned about uh, salmon and, and we're looking at research to that effect. But we've got uh, one research project here that involves hummingbirds, if you can imagine. Rufus hummingbirds and there's some uh, researchers from Royal Rhodes University that are studying the migratory patterns of rufous hummingbirds and what they eat and uh, any impacts that humans are having on them. And that's really got nothing to do with fish directly, but in looking at uh, the effect of herbicides and pesticides on that little creature, maybe it has a collateral uh, impact on, on fish as well. But the other research project that we've got on is directly related to, to salmon, and in particular, salmon that are produced in hatcheries. And for some time now, the researchers have found there's an anomaly that occurs with hatchery-produced salmon. And it's found in their, called otoliths, which are an inner ear bone uh, that provides the fish with the ability to hear, to maintain balance. And they found that for some reason, or reasons, they're not sure yet, hatchery fish, hatchery salmon, have an anomaly in the, in the otolith. What, what it is, is that naturally produced salmon, their otolith is mainly calcium carbonate. And there's a polymorph of calcium carbonate that's found in hatchery fish. It's called vaterite. And the concerning thing is that we're finding more vaterite in hatchery fish than naturally produced fish. What's causing that? does it in fact have a, have a bad effect on the fish? Is it going to be an impediment to the survival of that fish? These are questions that we don't have answers to. So the research project that we're involved in uh, has a doctoral candidate uh, from the University of Victoria conducting her doctoral thesis over the next five or six years, looking into the possible causes of this anomaly that's showing up in hatchery fish. And we're the first year of this, of this research project, and we're already finding that fish that we've looked at uh, under the microscope, the otoliths that we've extracted, are showing that battery. Now, is that a bad thing or a good thing? We don't know at this, at this point. It's intuitive that perhaps it might be bad because it affects the ability for that salmon to hear, to evade predators, to maintain balance when it's swimming, so we think it might have a bad effect, just don't know. We don't know whether it's caused by certain conditions in the hatchery, whether it's behavioral, whether it's related to stress, whether it's related to the food that we give them, all questions. And we're hoping that we're going to be able to open the door and shed some light on some of those questions because we think it's important for the ultimate survival of these creatures. And what we don't want to be doing is harming those creatures, thinking that we're doing benefit. Now, I'm not suggesting that it is harmful, but at this point, we just don't know. So it's an exciting bit of research. Yeah, the, the early research that showed this uh, anomaly uh, was in Atlantic salmon that are farmed. And there is information online. Uh, if one was to Google um, otoliths, hatchery fish, uh, Atlantic salmon, you'll, you'll find information to that effect. The research that our uh, doctoral candidate is carrying out right now is still in its infancy. It hasn't been published yet. It will eventually be published, but I would suggest the internet is the place to go. And there's a number of collateral studies going on to this effect right now. Uh, the flow is uh, here between 16 and 17 liters a minute. Anything more and it starts to boil the eggs. Mm -hmm. Anything less and they're not getting sufficient oxygen or enough water to take away the metabolites. So. Um, we regulate the flow very carefully in the, in the trays. I'll take out one tray, okay. Mm. 
Now, if you look, you can see eggs that are, have become opaque. Those are eggs that weren't fertilized for whatever reason. But consider this. In the river, a normal natural uh, fertilization, only about 20 or 30 percent of the eggs are fertilized. In our in our situation, because it's captive and because it's under controlled um, conditions, we'll get you know 99.9 percent .9 fertilization rate, right. which is great. Um, but it begs the question by the people saying, well, if we get if we're that efficient, if we're that good, why don't we just don't worry about habitat and create lots of hatcheries and do it in the hatchery? It's, it's a fool's errand if we follow that path, if we look towards technology to replace Mother Nature, um, we're, we're going down the wrong track. Mm -hmm. what, what happens is uh, in nature, because because the fertilization rate is so low, it takes a tremendous number of individuals to create a number of, the, the number, critical number of eggs that are necessary to maintain the population. So the genetic base is, is wide, lots of diversity. Here, we only use a few individuals to get the number of eggs we require, and um, so any any hiccups in the genetics are are, are created and, and then encouraged. Right. Yeah. So we, I'm a hatcher guy, and and uh, I, I'm hoping for a day when we don't need hatcheries. Mm -hmm. Right. But in some cases, uh, humans find it very difficult to coexist with salmon. Um, so we have to intervene with some technology. In, in, in lots of places that we've been working, we've intervened, we've created the conditions that allow for a sustainable run, we've introduced fish back into the system, and then we walk away. That's a success. Here in Goldstream, the coho probably never achieved that because we're competing for water in the summer with the Victoria, with Greater Victoria. Um, residential development, although the, the watershed is in a is in a park and, and restricted area, it's still we're getting flows from residential areas and light industrial areas. So there is an impact on the river itself. And the coho suffer. Chum, they do very well in Goldstream because they don't spend very much time in the fresh water. They come in, they spawn, the eggs incubate, the hatch, they come up out of the gravel, and they're only in there for in some cases hours before they start to transition into the, into the ocean. Whereas the coho spend 18 months of half their life in fresh water, so they're impacted for a great extent. Anyway, I'm going to put these back in because yeah. they won't necessarily like to be in the light. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, bye bye. See you in a while. Mm -hmm. I think, first of all, you have to understand the role that salmon play in the ecosystem. They are what we call a key species. A keystone species, sorry. And by that I mean that there are a number of other species of plant and animal that are either directly related to or rely on uh, salmon or indirectly rely on salmon. So if we were, you know, if we were to imagine a, a world without salmon, then we'd also be missing a whole bunch of other stuff. You know, if you go down to Goldstream, for instance, during the height of the salmon run, you're going to see thousands of seagulls, you're going to see eagles, you're going to see seals out in the estuary. There's otter, there's mink, um, and it goes on and on. But it's not just the creatures that move and have fur and feathers, but the plants in the, in the watershed depend on that surge of marine-derived nutrients, those nutrients that are taken into the fish's system when it's out in the ocean. And when that fish spawns and dies, those nutrients are then released into the food web. And, and the luxurious nature of our West Coast forest is directly related to those nutrients that come in from the ocean. And the salmon is the main vector for those nutrients. So any measure that we can undertake that will ensure the survival of salmon in perpetuity is going to be beneficial. The problem is human beings and salmon have not got along well in the past and don't get along particularly well now. And it's not because of any animus on the part of human beings. It's our activities that are not in sync with the salmon's requirements. Um, we, we, we have had bad logging practices. We um, require agriculture. We build huge residential developments. 
we pave, we pave with asphalt and cement. And all of that water that used to go into the soil and was, was absorbed like a sponge and eventually trickled into the, into the watersheds, that now goes down storm drains and immediately is, is sent out through storm, syst storm water systems into the ocean. So we're impacting on the ability of this creature to survive. And we can go on and on about the impact of human activities on, on this creature. So one of the things that, that became interesting to me because I've always been an avid fisherman, I've always been fascinated with, with the life cycle of the salmon, was how can we improve the conditions to make sure that, like my granddaughter, for instance, will have the ability to see these fish and, and show her children. I, I just want that as one of my, of my goals in life. So there are things that we can do now um, that we're aware of that mitigate for some of the damage that we cause. We, we can create parking lots that are that are semi-permeable, that water will actually go through instead of um, just, just running off asphalt and cement. We can have things like rain gardens where water that runs off your roof doesn't go into the storm sewer, it goes into a rain garden and it slowly trickles back into the earth. Um, we, have, we have recycling programs, we have um, measures to electrify our, our vehicles. There, there's any number of, of things that we can do now. now they're costly. Are we willing to pay the price that's that's required to mitigate for those things? And I, I think most people, given the opportunity, would say yes. The thing is that we have to educate them. We have to make them aware of the results of their activities. Um, I know I can go around the neighborhood uh, in the summer and find people that are washing their cars, and and this is during a period when water is is being rationed. You know. Do we really want to wash our cars with, with water that just runs down the drain and, and goes out to the ocean? I mean, this is just one example. I have school children that come up here, and, and I try to um, educate them in, in, in the use of water and how we can restrict our, our use, because we, we tend to be very profligate with our water. I mean, look around you today. It's raining. Goodness gracious, we have more water than we know what to do with. That's not the case in most of the rest of the world. So simple things. So when the kids are up here, I said, how many of you um, let water run in the sink when you're brushing your teeth? And a few put up their hands. And I said, well, it's a simple thing, but if you all turned off the water when you're brushing your teeth and only ran it to rinse off your toothbrush and rinse them out, collectively that re represents a, a lot of water. So think about other measures that you can take. So again, it's, it's this question of, of educating the people about the requirements of those species that coexist with us. And we want to be more uh, favorable in our, our coexistence with them. So, I mean, that's one of my driving forces, is to ensure that my granddaughter has the opportunity to see these wonderful creatures. Well, let me, let me back up a bit and, and give you um, a, sort of an overview of how I got into it. Um, I always, as I said, been fascinated with, with fish and fishing. My father was the one that introduced me to to fishing and fish, and that was at an early age. And I, as far back as I can remember, it would have been about 1949, I was about three years old, and my father took me to the Goldstream River to see the salmon run. My, my memory is very good, but I remember seeing what I thought were thousands of fish, and that stuck in my memory. So eventually I, I went through school and I wanted to go to university and be a biologist. And I was perhaps a bit immature when I left high school. I went right to university, and the, and the transition for me was difficult. Um, so I did two years of university, and then I uh, left university and went and uh, fulfilled a career in the armed forces for 25 years. When I retired from that, I had matured somewhat, and I thought my, myself I was a little bit more motivated in, in study. So I went back to, back to school, went back to university, and completed my, my training as a biologist, as a fish culturist. And, and then got into this business. Now my advice to, to those who are perhaps thinking about a career in this field, it's a long road and what you think uh, is your goal at this point in time may not, may not in fact become your goal as you wend your way through this, this, uh, this path. And, and the reason I say that is that uh, I had ideas about what I wanted to do when I was younger and when I eventually became a professional uh, biologist, 
uh, the world had changed somewhat. My view of the world and my view of what my career path might be had changed. So be flexible. Don't just strive for one, uh, one goal. You may find your studies will take you down a different path. Um, if you do become qualified as a professional or as a technician uh, or somebody who is, who is in, the, in the business of hatcheries or habitat restoration, um, the, the beginning might be tough because pay is not very good and there aren't that many permanent jobs. So you find yourself taking short-term contracts and they then get linked to another. You, you network and find other opportunities. Be prepared to move. Don't stay in one place. You'll have to go where the, where the employment goes. But you will eventually want to find a goal that will allow you to perform what you think you're interested in and enjoy it. There's nothing better than coming to what I call work on Monday morning and, and I enjoy it. I look forward to it. Uh, I often said to my son, um, I can't do that this week because i got to go to work. And his rejoinder to that is, Dad, you don't work. You get paid for your holiday. You get paid for your hobby. You know, so come off it. And I think, you know, that sounds a bit trite, but what I'm getting at is that if you can find some measure of activity within this field that that brings you happiness and brings you satisfaction, um, that's more important than than all the pay in the, in the world, I think. But it's a long road to hold. So um, just stick with it. Be patient and, as I say, be flexible. There's, there's two things that have, have really surprised me over time. And one of them is strictly a technical thing. It's, it's a biological, physiological thing. And it's the importance of the salmon to the ecosystem. I, I grew up mainly in the Maritimes, and we had Atlantic salmon there. And they're, they don't die after, after spawning. It's a con, you know, consistently a different life cycle. And when I came out here, um, I was amazed that these fish all die after spawning. They all die, and I thought, goodness gracious, even if they don't get a chance to spawn, they die. That seems to me very wasteful. Surprisingly, eventually I found out that the act of, of spawning and dying is the necessary cog in the wheel that ensures a healthy ecosystem because those nutrients that they bring in from the ocean are passed through the food web, and without those nutrients, we would live in a much poorer environment. That was surprising to me. When that light went on, well, gosh, it made all kinds of sense. And I thought, what a wonderful recycling program, better than any that we've ever achieved ourselves. If you go down to the river right now, in a good year um, in Goldstream River, there may be, you know, 250, 300,000 kilos of flesh in the form of the salmon. And they all die, and that dissipates somewhere. You go back down to the river in February or early March, you'll be hard-pressed to find any sign that they were there. Maybe the odd jawbone, maybe the odd gill cover, but everything else is gone. Where is it gone? It's been recycled into the, into the food web. That's magic. And that, that to me, was a, a, a tremendously surprising thing, but it all made eminent sense when I recognized what it was all about. Now, the other thing that surprises me is, because I'm involved in this seven days a week, you know, 365 days a year, um, I, I'm, I'm often amazed at, at how little the public knows about these wonderful creatures and the role that they play in the, in the ecosystem. So early on, when I recognized that, and I, and I was surprised by that, I, I figured then one of my, one of my uh, mandates, one of my roles should be education. And over the years, People ask me, what's, what's the hatchery about? Boy, oh boy, it's, you're producing fish, right? And I said, yes, we do. We produce fish. But arguably, as important a function that our hatchery performs is the education of our young people about the role that this fish plays, this creature plays in the food web. And it links all of that food web. And, it, and there's like an aha minute that you see in, in kids when they, they start to understand that. So that that surprise of the ignorance, and I, I use the term not to berate the public, not to berate people. It's, it's that we just don't know. We haven't made a, we haven't had a good job of passing on that information, and a lot of it, um, admittedly, is new research that's only been out there in the, in the world for, for a short time. But 
that is a fundamental, um, I believe, attribute of community hatcheries that uh, follow a path of conservation and education. Education about what we do is fundamental to the survival of these creatures and to the health of our environment around us. The volunteer movement in BC and Yukon is, uh, by last count, about 30,000 strong. That means people that are volunteering to get involved in, in habitat restoration, in hard salmon enhancement, in education, um, in fundraising, in political movements. I mean, it, 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 it's a big rainbow. Um, so I think it's important if you're interested in that sort of a, uh, a future or that, uh, even a hobby, go online, find out the information about local groups, and there's a number just in the local Victoria area, but they're throughout the province. Find out, we need volunteers, we need supporters, we need money. Uh, we need people who are willing to put the pressure on politicians. Uh, so there's many roles that can be performed by by people who are interested in helping this wonderful creature. And it's not just coming out and thrashing around in the river like we were doing today. There are as important, if not more important, functions that to me don't seem as much fun to some people, but they're absolutely necessary. Um, I, I'm going to put a shout out to the Pacific Salmon Foundation, for instance. Um, it's a wonderful organization who have funded a number of the uh, initiatives at this hatchery and in the southern Vancouver Island. without. Without groups like that and, and uh, entities like that, um, we'd, we'd find it a real struggle. So educate yourself on the internet. Read as much as you can. Talk to other volunteers who are involved. Talk to professionals. We're out here. Um, we have a website for the, the Goldstream Hatchery. Most of the groups that are involved in, in, in this, this sort of activity uh, have websites. So do a bit of digging. Talk to people who have been involved in it um, and just persevere.